For less than $1,000, this is a complete 1440p gaming package. We're talking the custom PC, monitor, peripherals, everything you need to start gaming from scratch in 1440p for 1,000 bucks. Considering we can play most games in 1440p high or ultra settings, I consider this a complete dub. Now, $1,000 for a full 1440p setup certainly has some drawbacks though, and we're gonna talk about those in just a bit. But if you're trying to save some money and jump into the PC gaming world and do it during this GPU shortage, this is the setup guide to follow. I'm going to do a quick review of everything we have here, including the parts of the build. We'll definitely be benchmarking this custom PC, and all of that's coming after a quick word from today's sponsor. Elegoo, and specifically their new Centauri Carbon, which is actually designed for people like our budget baller community. Now look, I've been in the 3D printing world for months now, and I know a fully enclosed, super classy looking printer like this looks like it's in that one to $2,000 range, but the reason I'm willing to have it be a sponsor is because it only costs $2.99. That's an unreal price for this level of printer, which is also as beginner friendly as it gets. After unboxing, you just gotta remove some screws, connect the screen, run the self-test, and afterwards, it's ready to rock. There's no in-depth dialing in or messing with the settings, it just works, which is great for first-time printers. It comes with a camera for time lapses, which I definitely took advantage of. You can store the filament roll on the right side so you're not reaching to the back every time, and it's super reliable with the auto leveling. It's hard to believe that a printer this good costs this little. I'll show you what all I printed with it in just a bit, and I'll have a link to where you can get one for yourself down in the description. All right, so as much as I wanna talk about the custom PC first, let's quickly work our way through the peripherals before we get to that. For a 1440p setup, budget allocation between the PC and the rest of the peripherals is super important. You gotta make sure you leave enough money for a 1440p monitor, which is exactly what I did. This is the Kurui GN03, which is a 27 inch 1440p 170 hertz IPS display with a one millisecond response time. Most of you know, I'm not your typical monitor reviewer. And to be honest, these days, I have a pretty gamer dad perspective on them. But honestly, this monitor has been one of my default budget 1440p recommendations lately, especially for a project like this where we're really limited on the budget. First, there's a response time setting on the monitor that was defaulted to normal, so I flipped that up to the fastest. And for the built-in color profiles, I actually think the default normal setting looks the best. These colors and even viewing angles look pretty solid to me, especially during a colorful game like Fragpunk. This looks really vibrant and super clean. The GN03 also handles glare pretty well, so that was pretty pretty much a non-factor. I will say that the stand is a little weak because it only has a tilt adjustment, so no height or swivel options. It is VESA compatible though, so if you need that flexibility, you can buy whatever VESA stand that you want. For a little bit of nitpicking on this stand, I also don't like how much surface area it takes up towards your keyboard. If you have a thinner width desk like I do, this eats up valuable real estate. For reference, this desk is 24 inches wide, and as you can see, there's no much extra space available. My only other gripe is that this monitor doesn't come with a built-in speaker. I know they all usually suck, but personally, I'm always a fan that they come with one rather than not. Other than that though, I think this monitor absolutely cooks and I feel like it's a solid 1440p experience. It's also FreeSync and G-Sync compatible and believe it or not, I turned on G-Sync to use with our graphics card, but more on that build later. As a final heads up, if you look at this monitor over on Amazon, it is a bit deceiving. I hate when companies put multiple drastically different models on the same product page because then the review data is a little compromised. Unless you look at each individual review where it tells you which monitor they bought, you don't know if that's solid four and a half star rating is for this monitor or a different one. But again, overall for 150 bucks, I think it's gonna be hard to beat and none of my complaints are that big of a deal. Behind the monitor, I actually hid one of these wide cable management clips that I printed with the Centauri Carbon. These have a little bolt underneath so you can fit it to the width of your desk and it works great. I also have another one directly behind the PC. I feel like having a 3D printer turns us all into a much more organized person because you can print stuff like this very easily. Next up, let's move over to the keyboard and I almost never do this, but let's actually start with the sound test so you know what we're working with. Yeah, I don't know about you, but that sound is completely scratching the itch in my brain. These pre-lubed creamy switches sound almost as good as my Aula F75 Pro with the Reaper switches. So satisfying to use, it's so good that even homework would be fun on this if you're typing with this keyboard. This is the Royal Kludge R65, and for whatever reason, the Amazon page says it's a 60% layout. The name R65 and dedicated arrow keys means that it's actually 65%, and I'm recently discovering that this is definitely my preference over 60. I love my Wooting HE60 at home, 
home, but I do miss these dedicated arrow keys, so 65% is the way to go in my opinion. I'm also a huge volume dial snob, and I'm not gonna lie, I think this volume dial is the best one that I've ever tried before. There's a notching click every time you turn it, and the satisfaction you get from it is about the same as pressing the creamy switches. RK definitely put a lot of work into the sound and feeling of this keyboard, which people like me definitely appreciate. But they also put a lot of effort into the aesthetics, and if you guys know anything about me, you'll know I value that probably more than anything. For this setup guide, I was specifically trying to not just go for 1440p performance, but also a sophisticated wood grain and black vibe, and this keyboard fits the bill perfectly. I love this brown, gray, and tan color scheme, and when I look at how this pairs with the PC, I honestly want to go right home and build my own setup around this color scheme. For less than 50 bucks, I'm extremely happy with the performance, sound, and aesthetics of this keyboard. The Atla F75 Pro is still my top pick at around $75, but for the $50 price range, this is my new favorite pick, but be sure to let me know in the comment section if there's any other models that I should try. These switches are hot swappable, by the way, and the keyboard does come with some basic RGB functionality, but personally, I think just completely turning them off fits our more sophisticated cigar smoking vibe a little bit better. That's also why I 3D printed this fake plant here in front of the keyboard. Even though the Centauri Carbon only prints one filament at a time, you can still print multiple color things like this if they're in multiple pieces. Next up, let's move on to the mouse, and this one threw me off a little bit. Typically, I've been a big fan of the Attack Shark X3, so I went with it yet again for a budget peripheral setup like this. I know there's some controversy online that some people are getting fake units from AliExpress or something. Honestly, I'm not really tracking it, so do your research if you're concerned, but from our testing, we have like five of these around the studio, and they've all worked great. This has actually become my go-to default mouse if we do need a new mouse around the studio somewhere. This is the first time that I bought the black version, though, and honestly, it felt a little different than the previous white X3s that we've had. At one point, I had multiple employees trying to figure figure out what the difference was, and we came to the conclusion that it's the weight distribution in this one particular that's different. With our previous white models, the weight seems to be evenly distributed, but with this black version, more of the weight is towards the front of the mouse and the back feels a bit empty. Now, to be fair, when using it, for someone like me, this still feels great, but I'm not entirely sure if they are in fact different models of the X3, or maybe there was a revision behind the scenes that I don't know about. What I do like is that it still feels super smooth and accurate when gaming without any noticeable delay. The DPI switch is good enough for me, but Attack Shark does have a lightweight piece of software, which is actually pretty clean and minimal compared the most. You can adjust the DPI, polling rate, sleep timer, lift off distance, and good stuff like that. I'm pretty happy with it, and for less than 40 bucks, it seems like a pretty decent buy to me. Right in front of the mouse is this super cool and actually functional phone stand. With 3D printers, you print all the parts you need, like these little dials and bolts, so you can adjust this stand at any angle that you want. Now we'll move on to the audio, and if you've been watching my content for a few months, you'll know that I've definitely been siding with IEMs these days. These are the KZ ZSN Pros, and I'm gonna be honest with you, the main reason why these stood out to me was the the overall aesthetic to match everything else. This brown color looks very neat with the wood grain aesthetic we're going for. I don't like that the cable is only three feet though, so if you want to plug it into the back of your PC, you'll need an extension or longer cable to plug into the IEMs. I did try gaming with it plugged in up at the front of the case, and I did actually hear some hardware interference sounds. That's not a fault of the IEMs because it's a best practice to plug in directly to your motherboard, but again, you'll need some sort of longer cable if you want to make that happen. Sound quality wise, I mean, these worked pretty great, and I do appreciate the sound of IEMs jammed up into your ear compared to a gaming headset. But at the end of the day, the quality didn't provide a wow factor for me, but I wasn't really expecting it to for $21. If I had to describe it, I would feel like it's actually lacking a little bit of the bass, but with my untrained ears, I'm not the best person to try to explain that, but I still think it's a pretty decent buy for about 20 bucks. Now to store the IEMs when I'm not using them, I also 3D printed this little storage box. I have these literally all around my house these days because you can print them in whatever size and color you want. I absolutely love how smooth this print job looks and the color combination as it matches with the rest of the setup. And finally, the last peripheral before we talk about the PC is the mouse pad. Self-promotion aside, I did just go with a ZTT embroidered mouse pad that we give out for free with our builds on ZTTBuilds.com. For this wood grain aesthetic, I only wanted an all black pad and you can find dozens of these on Amazon for like 10 bucks. If you want a different design, definitely go for it. That's just how I was envisioning this setup. And for any setup that I'm involved in, I'm gonna be drinking some coffee while I'm using it and this little coaster looks pretty cool. Honestly, I probably should have just gone with all black, but this brown looks pretty solid. Again, this is fantastic print quality from Elegoo, and you can print little things like this in like less than 30 minutes. But now it's time to get into the PC, and before I show you the parts list, I want to talk about the benchmark so you can see what we're working with. Up until this point, the peripherals have cost a grand total of $267, so that means we have a bit over $700 to use for the PC. I've created pure performance build guides before around that price, but not 
usually in a GPU shortage like we're in now. And for these setup guide videos, I also usually use a PC that we already made a video on, but this time I didn't. Now make no mistake, achieving 1440p gaming with only $700 during the GPU shortage is a tall task, and we're not gonna be able to crank up every game up to higher ultra settings. But with this CPU and GPU combination, these results are pretty solid, so let's check them out. With Call of Duty Black Ops 6, we cranked the settings up to 1440p ultra and got a pretty respectable 94 average FPS. Obviously, you can get way over 100 if you knock those settings down to high or medium. Marvel Rivals was up next, and in 1440p high, we got 76 FPS. Black Myth Wukong actually hit right on the money at 60 FPS in 1440p high. Fortnite in 1440p pro settings got a super smooth 269 FPS. And here's Nvidia's favorite Cyberpunk in 1440p high with 76 FPS. Here's the rest of the games that we tested, and honestly, this GPU did a bit better than even I was expecting. We do have a dedicated full benchmarking run video on the ZTT Extras channel, so check that out if you're interested. But finally, let's check out everything inside the build, and unlike my build guide videos, I'm gonna rapid fire most of this. Just like the peripherals, I'll have links to everything down in the description if you're trying to copy this for yourself. For the CPU, this is a Ryzen 5 7400F, which I bought for $122 on AliExpress. I have further details and benchmarks in a previous video about this brand new CPU from AMD. But just as a quick recap, if the price difference between the 7400F and 7500F is only a couple dollars, then I still would get the 7500F. But if it's like 20 to $30 or you're on a super strict budget, then this 7400F works pretty well. The motherboard it's plugged into is the MSI Pro B650M-P, which is basically the cheapest micro ATX B650 board I can find. For RAM, I use this Clevbolt 5 32 gigabyte DDR5 kit clocked at 6,000 megahertz. The SSD is the Clev Kraz C910 one terabyte gen 4 NVMe. And to polish off this motherboard prep, the cooler for the 7400F is the ID Cooling SE214 XT, which is all black and super clean. Now let's move on to the power supply. And this is the Raid Max Cobra 650 watt. Raid Max usually doesn't have a great reputation, but this is actually a tier C model on the new and improved PSU tier list. That's hosted on zttbuildhelp.com, by the way, where there's all sorts of free PC building help. And since this was on a killer new egg sale down to $39, that was an absolute steal and a half. I'm also a big fan of the case, which is the Okino Cypress 3, specifically this wood grain edition. And this only costs $60 over on Amazon. It comes pre-installed with all these black fans. And the only thing left to put inside of here is the GPU. Now, as a very important disclaimer, this was not the original graphics card that I wanted to use. This is the MSI Ventus 2X OC RTX 3070. And I grabbed this used over on eBay for $290. The RTX 3070 only has eight gigabytes of VRAM, which is one of the biggest problems with it these days. And even in a game like Fragpunk, I did get a VRAM limit warning, which you hate to see. But like I just proved in the benchmarks, this card can still kick it in 1440p. These results were honestly better than I was expecting. So I think we can still keep calling the 3070 a 1440p card, provided you're willing to game closer to the 60 FPS mark instead of in the hundreds. Now the original GPU I wanted to use was a used RX 6700 XT, and that does have 12 gigabytes of VRAM. That is becoming one of my default options for budget builds like this if you want to game in 1440p. Literally the only reason why I'm not using it is because I featured it in like three of the last six build guide videos. So I like to have some variety in these videos. So you can go with either the 3070 or the 6700 XT. Personally, I prefer the latter option. Overall though, here's the full parts list of the build, which totals out to only $3 more than what I was shooting for. The entire cost of everything on the desk minus the 3D printed accessories is $1,003. Be sure to let me know down in the comment section if there's different peripherals you think I should try out in the next setup guide video. And if you want to catch up on the last setup guide, the video for that is on the screen right now.